I've been hiding something from you. Sorry. But the Data General Dasher 6053 terminal I've been using with my Micronova has a problem. It didn't seem that bad at first. As I used the terminal, it would get a little brighter and I just had to turn it down every now and then. But it got worse. Much worse. And I've now spent so much more time staring at and prodding the guts of this thing than I ever would have expected. And I really thought that all hope was lost and it would never work again for a while. This is the roller coaster of how my dasher died and I was able to bring it back. When I first got the Dasher up and running, it seemed a little dim, which wasn't unexpected given it's nearly 50 years old and all of the small capacitors needed to reform in circuit. It eventually worked its way up to a reasonable brightness over the weeks I was using it and was working great. But the brightness level continued to rise, so much so you can even notice it happening if I speed up some footage. This wasn't the same kind of rise we had initially though. If I turned the brightness back down for a bit, it would reset below where it started and begin slowly rising again. Now this is a pretty solid sign of capacitor issues in the terminal and I'd already ordered replacements for everything in it. So I wasn't too concerned about it at this point, but then it did something different. I missed turning the brightness down once and the CRT shut off. It wouldn't turn back on. It's running and displaying video over composite here, but there's nothing on the CRT. This shutoff only happened a couple times ever, and if I left it overnight, it would be fine the next day. It seemed like some caps were overheating if I let it get too bright, and I thought I just needed to keep it dim for now. I had a lot of other stuff I was still trying to work through and figured the terminal could wait in line to be recapped. But one day, it shut down a lot quicker than previously, and right before I really needed it to work on something else. So it cut ahead to the front of the line and I thought I would do a simple recap on it to get it sorted out. Now, if it wasn't clear from the stream I did with Usagi Electric where we first got the Dasher up and running, I'd ordered a full set of replacement capacitors because I assumed something like this was going to happen. So I was neither surprised nor unprepared for this. I was very confident I knew exactly what the problem was because I was warned about a very strange capacitor in this terminal. I wasted no time tearing it down again to get right at the cap. It is a dual element Nichicon capacitor that I was told is very likely to fail because of its unusual construction. It is two completely independent capacitors inside of a single case. It's not bipolar, it's just as if there were two caps glued together. But I tested the capacitors in circuit with my LCR meter and they measured fine. You should remove a capacitor to measure it because you don't know what may be connected in parallel that can influence your reading, but I measured this cap before powering it as well and it was nearly the same, so it hadn't degraded. I did try to remove it, but it soldered into some difficult rivet through hole adapters and I put it off for later. And I'll just tell you now that later came when I was at my wits end and I did remove the cap and it was totally fine. If it wasn't the multi-element cap that hadn't had the problem, it had to be something deeper in the CRT. I said it was the CRT that shut off, and that is all that fails. I mentioned in the last video that the Dasher has a composite video output, and that always continued working. The composite output comes directly from the logic boards that are separate from the CRT. You can think of everything in the Dasher as being divided into three-ish parts. On the back panel is the DC power voltage regulation. That is only used for the digital logic boards in the backplane beside the CRT. The CRT is a standalone module that is almost entirely self-contained. It takes in low voltage AC power from the transformer and self-regulates all of its own power from that. I later found out that this is a Motorola M3000 CRT chassis. That information came from Philip, who has been a massive help in this process because he's a very odd word processor from around the same time that uses the same CRT module and was able to take measurements for me to compare against. Within the CRT module, there are three main PCBs. The one that has the dual element cap on it is the DC regulation board that outputs a 70 volt rail that everything else is derived from. On the other side of the unit, we have two PCBs that control the horizontal and vertical deflection. It's easy to remember which is which because the horizontal board is mounted vertically and the vertical board is mounted horizontally. Perfectly sensible. Now at this time, I didn't know what the CRT module was or which boards did what, but I did know that they were chock full of capacitors that I'd already ordered replacements for. My next goal was to pull off and measure some of those. Not the easiest thing to do though because of how the CRT chassis goes together. 
I cannot overstate how hard it is to work on this. It takes about 10 minutes just to get the PCBs unmounted because everything is so tight and mounted weirdly. The anode cable is only exactly long enough to go from the flyback to the tube, meaning there is very little wiggle room. On top of that, the cables for the deflection coils are all connected individually and share some colors. So for the entirety of the repair process, I did not disconnect them and risk reconnecting them incorrectly. So even when they were out, I didn't have a lot of slack to work with them. I lost count of how many times I've had to remove these boards, but it never got faster because it's just so difficult to work with. With the horizontal and vertical boards free though, I could start to check the caps. Now I'll mention the green capacitors on these are film polymer caps. Uh, they are sealed with wax, but they're not wax paper. And I did measure a couple of those and all of them were totally fine. So I didn't end up replacing any of those on this throughout the entire repair process. But there was a nice, easy to reach electrolytic cap on the side of the board that is a great candidate to check. But I can't miss the chance to point out how evil this cap is. The polarity stripe on it is indicating the positive side. This goes right up there with USB A to A cables as a thing that should never have been brought into existence. But anyway, I lifted one side of it to measure. It's marked as a 220 UF cap, but I measured it as 86 UF with two ohms of ESR. That thing was absolutely toast. I checked more of the caps that were similar electrolytics on the boards and they all measured bad like that. So I finally got to put my cap order to use and replace them all. After reassembling the chassis the next day, I was able to test it and... Ah! Blinking cursor. And it did the exact same thing. The problem didn't go away. The problem turned out to be different and weird now because the CRT was rastering, but the display would collapse as I turned up the brightness despite showing nothing. There was one more electrolytic I knew I didn't replace because it was kind of strange. I could remove it without taking out the boards and wasting half an hour, so I did that, which meant I had to put its replacement on the backside for now. That cap measured with 16 ohms of ESR, which is insanely high, so it definitely needed to be replaced. But it still wasn't the problem. That was now all of the electrolytic caps in the analog signal path, and I was still having an issue a very concerning position to be in. I didn't really have a direction to go from here, so I thought I would just double check everything on the power input panel. All of the rails and capacitors on there measured fine though. I discovered one concerning thing though, a blue wire had been knocked loose coming from the transformer. I spent some time trying to nail down when that might have happened since almost every time I've opened this it's been on camera, but it didn't really matter in the end because there was only one place it could connect to and that was for the 200 20 volt selector, so it didn't solve it either. It was at this point that I found out this was a Motorola M3000 and was pointed towards the service manual, which gave me some new stuff to check. So I started checking some input voltages, which all looked good, and measured that 70 volt DC rail on it, which was tuned to 72 volts on mine. Ultimately, that voltage difference didn't end up mattering, but I did tune it down to 70 volts by the time I was done with this. There's no reason to run things with more power if I don't need to. With all of the parts in the dasher case, it's not really easy to measure anything else, so I turned my attention to the combination brightness pot and power switch. If it was dirty or bad, that could be causing a disconnect, making the image not display. I didn't get any change out of cleaning and cycling that, though. While I was deoxidating the pot, it was pointed out to me that the pink crimp connectors on the transformer can have connection issues as well, so I pulled all of them off one by one and deoxidated those two. No change. I had to call it for the day. I didn't really think it would be the transformer connectors, but I was grasping at straws by this point. The next day, I pulled everything out of the dasher case. I needed better access to the parts, and it was impractical with it all in there. The next thing I ended up trying to check was the brightness pot on the horizontal PCB that could be bad, preventing the image from displaying. It is deep in there, though, and not easy to adjust without the proper non-conductive tools that I didn't have. I tried adjusting it anyway, but yet again, I didn't get any change in results and decided it was time to pull the analog boards out again. I also decided I was going to get that multi-element cap off one way or another to check it on its own. This was when I finally found out it was definitively fine. I was fried at this point, and someone suggested it could be a Zener diode being bad, which is what took down my Pioneer SX780 from around the same time. My Flukes diode test mode didn't have enough oomph to check a Zener diode, though, and I would really need a curve tracer. 
good thing I just bought one. I didn't really think the Zener diode was going to be a problem at this point, but I needed a break and playing with the curve tracer for an hour was a welcome reprieve. I did eventually measure the Zener diode from the 70 volt board. Yeah, it was fine. That wasn't the problem. The next day, I went back to do some more checks on the CRT. I measured how much current it was pulling on the 70 volt rail up to the point of the raster collapse, and it was a perfectly stable 364 milliamps the whole time. So it probably wasn't something heating up and pulling more current and more power. I wanted to check that because earlier I measured the 70 volt rail getting pulled low during the collapse and pulling too much current could have been the cause of that. I began to set up for a different test and moved the metal cage that holds the analog boards and noticed that the flyback cable looked horrible. I was immediately concerned that the strangest of the problem could be an internal break in the flyback. I tried to measure some signals related to it and they seemed fine. I didn't want to mess with it too much more in case I could break the anode cable and left it to do some more research and planning. I'd posted a photo of the horizontal PCB on Discord, and one of my viewers, Matrox Millennium, was curious about a potentially bad solder joint on Q54. It wasn't easy to see from the photos that I had, but bad solder joint could make sense for the weird issues I was having as well. I had spent way too much time on this thing at this point, and was done filming until I had some actual progress, so I don't have footage of what happened next, but I did take photos. Q54 didn't look great, but it wasn't that bad, all things considered. As I was looking at it from another angle to see a slight ridge along the base of the solder, I noticed a canyon of a crack and a support for the transformer on there, and the pin right next to it wasn't looking so hot either. As I poked around, there were garbage solder joints all over the board. Specifically though, every pin that goes to the header for the brightness knob looks broken, and that would definitely cause a loss of video. I decided to reflow every single pin on both analog boards. I didn't film this three hour process. You're welcome. It is very slow to do bulk soldering like this and make sure you don't make any mistakes. When it was done, I put the boards back in and got nothing at first. But then I saw and heard something really weird. There is video. The video was finally back, but centered strangely, and the audible pitch of the horizontal raster had dropped significantly. I, to this day, don't know what the weird pitch issue was. It went away on its own, but I knew exactly what the video issue was, and it made sense. At this point, I had replaced every electrolytic capacitor in the CRT. Well, except for the weird one that I initially thought would be bad. This means that any adjustable RC or LC charge time circuits would likely be out of tune. In particular, the adjustable thing I was concerned about was related to this being a self-scan CRT. Without a video signal, it will still raster and display a blank image. When a video signal is present, it syncs its internal scan rate with the input video. In the service manual, we can see it uses the standard NTSC horizontal sync rate and has a tolerance of 500 Hz deviation from that. If the internal scan rate changed, say because someone changed a capacitor involved in the frequency generation, the phased lock loop that syncs the internal and external signals wouldn't work. So I pulled out the scope again to check what the internal scan rate was and found it was all the way up to 17 kilohertz, way out of spec, and being faster made sense because the display was squished in. There is a variable inductor that is used to set the internal scan rate. I just needed to adjust that to bring the frequency back down to 15.6 kHz, and it should be golden. By this point, I had bought some plastic adjustment tools for exactly this. But they ended up all being metric and wouldn't fit. So I had to repeatedly turn off the CRT, make an adjustment, turn it back on, and measure it. AC voltage going through the variable inductor would cause a metal tool like my Allen wrench to inductively forge, or put in other words, get crazy hot so I had to take baby steps like this. Eventually though, I got the signal dialed in, and when I did, the video looked perfect. Although it was a little bright because I'd messed with the vertical PCB's brightness pot. After just a little bit more calibration of that, I was ready to finally say that I had successfully repaired the dasher. Since I'd taken all of the guts out, I figured there would never be a better time than now to give this thing the deep cleaning it needed. And after the weeks long technical diagnostics nightmare, I welcomed the catharsis of a mundane cleaning session. 
I started with taking the keyboard apart and wiping off the top plate. There were a couple of bad spots on it I used a melamine sponge on, but going too harshly was slightly removing the paint, so I kept the pressure light. Then came the keys themselves, which I didn't want to try removing and risking bricking the plate mounts, so I just gently cleaned them all in place. Then the massive plastic base got to wipe down. Both the base and the top plate have wear spots on them from a lot of usage, so they'll never be perfect, but they came out really well. With the keyboard done and put aside, I did the back plate of the display unit that has all of the configuration legends and the build specs label. There was some glue residue on this that I really wanted off, but it also needed some general cleaning. But I didn't go too hard on it, again due to risk of damaging the paint or labels. Next, I did the top and bottom shells, which were the most complex shapes. They also have a texture that held down dirt that took several passes to clean it out. The handle holes in the front bezel were the worst, where it had been touched the most on both parts. Then it was the mount base, which I'd actually learned something about while doing this. It can rotate side to side. There's a plastic slip ring in it to provide some slight friction, but mine was adjusted too tight and was just clamping down onto it. The arm piece on this is all metal. It is extremely sturdy and was just a little dusty. The bottom plate cleaned up way more than I thought it would. I had to give it several passes to make sure I got everything off of it. Last up was the faceplate. It's all plastic with no legend, so it was a breeze to scrub down. During the reassembly, I made sure not to over-tighten the rotate pivot so it would actually work now. Before I put the shell back on, I had to do the final reassembly of the electronics. I was so looking forward to never seeing these analog PCBs again. You have no idea. Everything is a pretty tight fit in this case and must go back in in the correct order. I'd done it enough times by this point that it was second nature, though. I dropped it all back onto the base, put the top back on, and secured it all down. I reunited it with the keyboard, and that was it. The dasher was done. You have no idea how much of a relief it was to have it back together and working. I've come to really appreciate this machine. It's now one of my favorite pieces of hardware I have, and, and I was devastated at times when I thought I wasn't going to be able to find its fault. But now I'm going to turn it back over to me right after the assembly was done to close this video out. I'm going to call that there for the Dasher D2 or 6053. Oh my gosh. I'm actually shocked that it's fully functional again here, man. I'm just, I'm looking at my reference monitor in awe. Like, it came back. <laughs> I really, really thought... Uh, it was a goner there for a bit. I was already planning to uh, get <clears throat> one of my two IBM PS2 monitors that are monochrome VGA because I'm pretty sure it would have been possible to connect the output of the backplane cards to that. And it's a 12 inch that would have fit in there. Like I was, uh, I was very sure it was toast. But uh, yeah, the crack solder joints, the bad capacitors being replaced with the new ones that change the circuit behavior. Like it was, it was just a bunch of stuff that I had to go through and fix to finally get it working again. And man, it is just so much better. This image here is so bright and clear now. I mean, it's not incredibly bright. I don't really want it to be either because I don't want to burn in the tube any more than it already has been. So uh, I'm happy with where it's at. It's very, very usable now. So even with the bright filming lights pointed directly at it, they're... You can see there's text on there. That's a lot better than <clears throat> HP 200. Some things can uh, say, so yeah, it's doing pretty well. But <sighs> we're going to call it there. I now get to go back to the other projects that I was working on with the Micronova and stop uh, pulling my hair out over fretting on the uh, Dasher D2 here. I'm so, so happy it works. And... Um, it hasn't been on for that long, but I swear it's running cooler now that I've turned down the voltage from 72 to 70 on the CRT. So that'll be nice too. But we're going to call it there. If you enjoyed watching this video, then you may want to subscribe to be notified when I release another one because there will be plenty more videos coming up that will feature this wonderful machine. If you want to help support the channel, you can find me on Patreon. But for now, that's it. And I will see you next time. And with everything done now, I can continue the documented history of the machines.